All right, man, peace. You know, brothers, as I sit down here and I think about it, I realize that probably one of the main reasons why, at least in the modern history or the modern era of the NBA, that the Chicago Bulls dynasty stands out. And in the pre-modern history of the NBA, the Boston Celtics dynasty under Bill Russell stands out, is that their dynasties ended in triumph, which is very rare, whether it be in sports history or conventional, i.e. regular history. Most dynasties end in an ignominious or an abject fashion, meaning in embarrassment, in failure, in catastrophe. And when I look at the Golden State Warriors, I have to wonder if they can rebound from this. Because they seem to not only be physically broken, but mentally broken after they lost the NBA Finals in the way that they did against the Toronto Raptors. It reminded me a lot of many of the other dynasties that I saw fall by the wayside, whether it be the Shaq and Kobe Lakers who lost two years in a row. In 2003, they lost to the San Antonio Spurs. And if I remember correctly, they lost a decisive game in L.A. In 2004, they got blitzkrieg by the Detroit Pistons and Kobe Bryant was terrible. The Detroit Pistons, they had a great run in the late 80s. And in 1991, they got swept by the Chicago Bulls. The Houston Rockets won back to back. And in 1996, they got their asses kicked out of the playoffs. It happens. And for the most part, when these dynasties get beat, they don't come back. So will the Golden State Warriors be back? I'm not quite sure as of now. If by some miracle they're able to re-sign Kevin Durant and Klay Thompson, I do believe that they'll be able to make one last run at it, but most likely not next season, maybe for the 2021 season. We'll see. So anyway, they're going to talk about it, and I'm going to chime in. And in addition to covering the topic of whether or not the Golden State Warriors dynasty is over, we're also going to hear Mr. Kendrick Perkins attempt to detonate on Steph Curry. Let's also keep in mind that Kendrick Perkins and Steph Curry have a bit of a history going back in the finals where Steph Curry and Kendrick Perkins got into a little dust up on the sideline. So anyway, they're going to talk about it and I'm going to chime in. Kendrick Perkins still here with us. Five straight finals appearances for the Warriors. Three chips, but also two losses thanks to LeBron and Kawhi. So a lot of question marks surrounding this team heading into the offseason. Perk, I want to start with you on this one. Just going to ask it. Is the Warriors dynasty over? I thought you were going to ask if you could switch gears. Well, oh, I think it's I think it's in question. Just for, just for the simple fact that you know with injuries like Tanya ACL, uh, Achilles injury, I took. I agree. Those are two terrible injuries. Those are about the two worst injuries that you can get. I would say that the only injury worse than an ACL tear is probably a patella tendon tear. A patella tendon tear is right up there with the Achilles. If I remember correctly, Victor Cruz got that injury with the New York Giants a couple of years ago, and that pretty much ended his career. ACL. And yeah, guys come back in six months, seven months, or whatever the case may be, but what people don't know is, is that it takes a full 22 to 24 months to you to, for you to get back to your normal self for us with an ACL injury. So it would take Clay Thompson at least two years to get back to Clay Thompson. Well, you're basing that on what the doctor told you. And no disrespect, brother, during your NBA playing career, you were about 50 pounds overweight. I seriously doubt if it's going to take Clay Thompson 24 months to get back to what he was before. I would say that it'll take him probably 15 months to get fully back. As far as returning to the basketball court, I predict that he'll be back by next February, maybe March. These injuries is the worst. I mean, it's almost career ending. Um, we don't know how Kevin Durant's going to bounce back. I mean, obviously, he's just a, a talent that you, we probably won't never see again in the history of the NBA. But, you know, that's, that's two years of wasted. And teams are getting... KD will probably be back by next March as well. Next March or next April. Watch for that. Kevin Durant, he's extremely light, as we all know. I just don't see an Achilles injury keeping him out for the entire season next season. I just don't see it. I think that he's going to sign a guaranteed contract, maybe with the Golden State Warriors, and then they'll execute a sign and trade either before this upcoming season or maybe possibly they'll pull the trigger on a trade after next season if Kevin Durant is just dead set on leaving the franchise. And that'll be a present for both Kevin and the Golden State Warriors because, you know, Kevin deserves to have the max. And if he wants to go somewhere else, the least that Golden State can do is give him the max and then be able to get something back in return for him. 
But I do think that Kevin will make a return onto the basketball court next season, probably sometime in mid-March. But we'll find out. The West is going to get a whole lot harder for Golden State. And, you know, I tell you, it's, it's definitely, you know, it's doubt right here. And for me, for us with that dynasty, man, I think, you know, it could be, it's 50-50. But I just want to be clear. You said you had an ACL and it took you two years to get back to normal. To normal, yeah. And you're saying, Kate. Right, but brother, no disrespect. You wasn't a good player before the ACL tear. You had no offensive moves whatsoever, and you played at about 45 pounds overweight. So it's very difficult to gauge the rehab time on an ACL or an Achilles based on you because you were not a particularly fit athlete to begin with. The Achilles, that, that injury is even worse. Yeah, yes, and we just don't know. Like, you could recover and be back on the court to six, in six or seven months, but... Yeah, you're not the same guy. No, and teams are getting better. Teams are getting better, and... These guys are not getting younger, by the way. How do you define dynasty? Let me tell you how I define dynasty. I think if you have the same core group of guys, the same nucleus, and you can connect championships, that's still the same dynasty. I'll give you an example. Um, let's talk about champions in the 80s. I think the Lakers had a dynasty in the 80s. Lakers, Sixers, Celtics, Lakers, Celtics, Lakers, Lakers, Pistons, Pistons. If the Lakers would have beaten the Bulls in 1991, I'd say the dynasty was still going on. You could take a year or two off and not win a championship as long as you're a powerhouse. Always. I'm not quite sure about that. I don't think that you can lose two years in a row or have another team win two years in a row in the midst of your run and call what you have a dynasty. In my opinion, for you to call what you have a dynasty, you have to start out at the very least in back-to-back -back championships. But in my view, you have to you have to have won three championships in four years or three in a row to classify as a real dynasty. So I'll agree with you that the Lakers were a dynasty because they were able to win championships in 87 and 88. So that allows the connection all the way back to 1980. I will I will even say that the Detroit Pistons, the bad boy Pistons, had the rudiments of a dynasty because they went back to back and they were dominant in the Eastern Conference all the way from 87 to 91. But I would not even call them a dynasty because by my strict definition, the Chicago Bulls were a dynasty. The L.A. Lakers of the 80s were a dynasty. The Shaq and Kobe Lakers were a dynasty. I, I'd give slight mention to the Miami Heat of the 2010s with LeBron and D. Wade in the same way that I will give, you know, that that slight mention to the bad boy Pistons and also to the Clutch City Rockets of the mid 90s. But I would not call them dynasties. Now, what the Golden State Warriors have had thus far is a dynasty because they won three in four seasons. But in the midst of your dynasty, in the midst of your run, to have another team win back-to-back, -back, I can't even count that. Like, if the Lakers had won in 91, I'm not quite sure if I could have considered that a part of their dynasty because you had another team win championships back-to-back -back years. So they were clearly dominant. And winning chips, to me, that's part of the same dynasty if it's the same group, core group of guys, right? So my Yankees won it in 96, not in 97, 98, 99, 2000. Right, but they won four and five seasons. Once again, they were a dynasty because they won three straight. Barely missed it in 01, got knocked out early in 02, came close in 03. Oh, they got knocked out late by the... If they would have won it in 04, I'd say that's the same dynasty, same core... No. Same dynasty. Now let's think about this. Who's the real core of this uh, Warriors group? It's Steph, Clay, and Dre. Iguodala too, but he's aging and you know Livingston may be done. And KD. KD is more than a member of the core. He's pretty much the hub itself. I mean, th that pretty much is understood that he is the hub itself, especially at this point in their dynasty. The, the leadership is transitioning over from Steph to KD or at least it was at the point that KD went down because I agree with Kendrick the other teams in the NBA have gotten better they've gotten more physical they've learned how to stretch the flow with their three-point shooting as well and even though Golden State is still the best at it the rest of the teams in the league have caught up to them and in order for them to have been able to defeat a Toronto Raptors squad a Milwaukee Bucks squad or a Philadelphia 76ers squad KD would have to have been their best player Death Trey and Clay if those three 
continue to contend year in and year out, not next year because everyone's hurt, but contend, powerhouse team, and they win a championship in the next two or three years, even four years, I'm going to say that's part of the overall Warriors dynasty. I predict Steph, Dre, and Clay got one more in them at least at some point, and they will be a powerhouse until then, so the dynasty is not over. The dynasty is over if you're measuring it by, by winning championships. I agree. Measuring it by competing for championships, it's not. Mm. I'll give you brothers another example. The San Francisco 49ers, they had a dynasty in the 80s. I don't consider that Steve Young championship against the Chargers in 94 a part of the dynasty of the 80s. I just don't consider it that, even though that came four years down the line. Max Kellerman would, by his definition, I wouldn't. But what makes the San Francisco 49ers a, a true dynasty is that they won four chips and they won back to back. I think they'll still be around and they'll be in the mix, albeit not next year. I think next year is the year where there's a multitude of teams that would derail the Golden State Warriors from getting back to the conference finals, right. let alone an NBA finals. But I think the year after, once KD and Clay are healthy, at least one of them anyway, I think they'll be right back in the fold, right back in that championship picture. That's just my estimation about it all. I'm not going to count it. We've got to take into account the way the game is played, the way the game is called the fact that it favors shooters it favors up tempo it's a softer version of the game now if this was back in the in, in, in the good old day <laughs> you understand then it would be a wrap you right. understand they had hurt Steph a long time ago they had looked at him you know looked at clay looked at the pretty boy backcourt yeah. they, like, yeah. <laughs> they, 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 they would they would even try to they would try to hurt him i'm just telling you that and and, and, and you know it's just the way it was, Molly and Max. It's just the way it was back in the day. When this guy talks so much shit. The way that some of these dudes talk, you would think that there were no slightly built players back in the 80s and 90s. Go look at George Gervin. Look at Reggie Miller. Isaiah Thomas, <laughs> Isaiah Thomas was about six feet and a half, maybe on a good day, a buck 80. The way Stephen A. Smith talks, you think that everyone who played back in the 80s and 90s was a power lifter. Give me a break. Her skill set was superior, all right? The bottom line is, if you were a guy that was slight of frame, to a lesser degree, even KD, even though I think KD was so surreal, he would have overcome that because he's 6'11". Right. He's like a better version of George Gervin. The ice. Agreed. George Gervin, okay? But for the most part, if you're slight of frame, particularly in the 80s and the 90s, that's not clay, though. They, they hurt you. That's, that's not, not clay. Cl well, the fact of the matter is that most of the NBA players in the 80s were slight of frame. Look at Michael Jordan circa 1987. He was slight of frame. That's not Clay. Clay is that's tough. Clay that's, that's, but that's definitely Steph. They'd, you remember that Steph had those ankle injuries? Yeah. Oh, they, they'd untied the shoe. Right. They'd have stepped on his ankle on purpose. Absolutely. They'd have done a whole bunch that's of stuff to take him out. They're not doing that kind of stuff right oh. now. So because of that, with them being able to shoot the basketball the way that they are, they're always going to have a chance as long as they're on the floor. But with us speculating as to the health of a KD, the health of a Clay, because that's your reality, right. and you can't necessarily go out and get another marquee guy to join Steph and Draymond, the bottom line is I think next year they're not going to be so, okay. in the top so four. So this is, I mean... Yeah, they definitely won't be in the top four next year, at least when it comes to the the rankings in the Western Conference. I, I really think that it would be a great achievement for them to make the playoffs because they're going to be approaching next season with a skeleton crew. I think that Steph Curry is going to try to make a run for a regular season MVP, and they're going to reassess where their team is at by next All-Star break. And if they're somewhere around 5 to 10 games below 500 around the All-Star break next season, it would not surprise me if Steph Curry suddenly comes with some strange injury that might keep him out for the remainder of next year as well as Draymond. It would not shock me at all. But if they head into next All-Star break, say 10 games over 500, shocking the league, Steph Curry definitely going to try to press for next year's regular season MVP, and they're going to see if maybe they can bring back Clay and Kevin Durant and make, you know, make some type of, of carpet ride magical playoff run in next year's playoffs. It would not shock me at all. This is my question. And I said this, if I'm KD, I'm coming back to Golden State. But we don't know what Kevin Durant That's right. do. So. Right now, the stage is set perfectly for Kevin Durant to come back to Golden State. It's perfect for him to come back to Golden State. Because he would no longer be considered 
someone who was just trying to hitch his wagon to their star. He actually will get the credit that he's always deserved as being the best player on that team. Not necessarily the leader or the most impactful player per se, but the best player on that team. He'd get full credit. He can make the most money there. They're going to owe him, so they're never going to question his heart again because he basically gave up his body for the squad. I have no idea why he would want to leave at this point. It's pretty much perfect for him right where he already is. Always remember, perfect is the enemy of good, and sometimes perfect is the enemy of perfect because his current situation is perfect for him. There's no way that he's going to go that's going to be any better. Brooklyn's not going to be any better. I know that he has his little bromance with Kyrie Irving, but like they always say, you don't really know someone until you live with them. Kyrie's someone who's nice to hang out with at the All-Star break, but being in a locker room with him every day, with his weirdo hermetic bullshit, praying, <laughs> praying to the horn god and the mother goddess and the divine child, going out into the woods and having seances and trying to conjure spirits. Is that really what you want, KD? going to determine that's going to be a major factor in whether or not the dynasty is over because we have to remember that they went out to get KD because they needed KD because Steph does have a history of disappearing or not stepping up to the level that he's supposed to in the finals I mean it's now do you believe hey, me Perk said it you a believe spade, that? a spade is a spade a spade is a spade and a heart and a heart is a heart it is what it is you know the stage was set perfectly for him this finals to go out here and be the best player that he could be mm -hmm. he had uh 47 points in uh, game three game three that was the most meaningless 47 points I ever seen that's ridiculous he, so <laughs> Stephen A. Smith jumped in. That's ridiculous. Once again, please keep in mind that Kendrick Perkins and Steph Curry, they have a little bit of a history. Also keep in mind, as Kendrick Perkins is going to allude to later on in this segment, remember that he was a member of the OKC Thunder, and he played alongside Russell Westbrook, and we know that Russell Westbrook has had a rivalry with Steph Curry for a long time now. Me. No, it's not. Like, Those no, 27 points were not five. You won it. Game That's five. Not true. His game five. His game five was the played. best game no. he ever played. Yeah, I'm not saying that it wasn't, but what Thank I'm saying you. to you is, actually, the best game that Steph Curry's ever played in the finals was probably Game Five against Cleveland in the 2015 Finals. Of course, people strategically and conveniently forget how dominant he was in that game, albeit lighting up Matthew Della Vadova, but he still got the job done in a pivotal moment. I would say that that was his overall best game in the finals. And let's also not forget that he had a bevy of standout performances against Cleveland in 2017 and 2018. In 2017, he almost averaged a triple-double. The 47 in it, game three it, was It was so, because... Excuse me, time stop, stop, stop. Let me finish. Let me ask you this question. Go ahead. Whether it's, it doesn't matter. You play with Ray Allen. You play with Paul Pierce. You play with KG stuff. You trying to tell me you never saw those dudes explode and ball in a game they lost? Yeah, sometimes you look. I'm saying sometimes you ball and it's significant, but it, you this, can't finish the job. This one. There's only so much that a Steph Curry is going to be able to do in the finals. When you're talking about the finals, it's the two best teams. For the most part, they have the two best coaches and the two best rosters. Steph Curry is a player who's six foot two and a half does not have an outstanding vertical leap, does not have huge hands. He's not going to be able to take over games physically. Either he's going to make his jump shots or he's not. He can take it to the cup. He's a great finisher around the basket, but he's not going to be able to leap over the defender at the cup, at the rim. He's not going to be able to do that. So he has to throw up a lot of flip shots, runners, etc. Those are prone to be missed. He's someone who's known for missing dunks, wide open dunk attempts. So there's only so much that we can expect from him once again. There's more expected from Steph Curry in big playoff games than any man of his stature in the history of the NBA, by far. No one ever expected Isaiah Thomas to average 25 and 10 in the finals. No one ever expected that. No, no one ever expected Tiny Archibald to do it. No one ever expected Steve Nash to do it. People would have just been happy if Steve Nash made it to the finals. So just with the high level of expectation that people have for Steph Curry, that shows you that we have to start assessing him differently we have to start saying he must be a top 20 player of all time if the expectations are on a Kobe Bryant Kawhi Leonard LeBron James Hakeem Olajuwon level of, of output because we're not judging Steph Curry according to other small men 
were judging him according to great wing players, guys 6'6", 6'7", 6'8", who could explode at the rim. That doesn't mean it was meaningless. Sometimes we get caught up in numbers. I agree with that. As fans, we get caught up in numbers. And what I'm telling you is, is that at, during that game, they were down, the most that they ever cut the lead to was about seven points. Other than that, it was a 15-point game, a 12-point game. All right, all right, all right, all right, okay. all right, all right, all right. Okay, wait, wait, when were you in Oklahoma City? What years did you play there? I played there four and a half years. Before. Okay, okay. Were you there a few years ago when they lost to Golden State? No, I was not. Okay, because I need to ask you this question. KD's your boy, right? Yeah. Russell Westbrook, you're pretty damn cool with him, aren't you? Damn right. Damn right. He's the man. <laughs> all right, all right, no question. Uh, Let me ask you this question. When they went up against the Golden State Warriors and Clay dropped 41 in game six with 11 threes and then ultimately Golden State came back, over, overcame a 3-1 deficit, was were those performances by KD or Russell Westbrook meaningless? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. absolutely. Thank you. Wow. Absolutely. Just, it's okay. no different. And, and listen, All right. All this, right. this okay. the, so it's Steve, meaningless. Smith, but look, Stephen A. Smith, this is the whole problem I have, okay? People criticize Russell Westbrook for stat chasing. Now we're getting to the point. You're standing up for your homeboy, Russell Westbrook. No disrespect, brother, but just for you to bring up Russell Westbrook's name and your criticism of Steph Curry shows that you have an agenda because Russell Westbrook has not accomplished anywhere near what Steph Curry has accomplished in the playoffs. Just the fact that Steph Curry was able to defeat that Oklahoma City Thunder team was a referendum on Russell Westbrook because that OKC team had twice the amount of raw talent that the Golden State Warriors had. Twice the amount of natural talent. Russell Westbrook, just as, a, as an athlete, has at least three times the athletic ability of Steph Curry. Now, where Steph Curry stands out is his great hand-eye coordination. His hand-eye coordination is not for real. But if you're talking about running and jumping, Russell Westbrook is supposed to run laps around him. KD was supposed to average 40 points a game, but because the, the overall basketball IQ of the OKC Thunder was so low, that allowed the Golden State Warriors to come back. But once again, there's no reason why, why Kendrick Perkins should be evaluating Steph Curry according to the barometer that has been set by, by uh, Russell Westbrook. If Russell Westbrook had won just one championship or two, then I could say okay. But he has a long way to go for his name to be mentioned alongside Steph Curry when it comes to accomplishments. He averaged a triple double, and mm -hmm. so what? I didn't say it was no, meaningless. No, you just no, did. No, I'm saying people criticize. Okay, I'm not. I didn't say you. Yeah, I, think I said people. Yeah. They do criticize Russell Westbrook when you say, "Oh, he averaged a triple double," and you watch Stephen Adam, Steve, Stephen Adams box out guys, and Russ come steal his rebounds, and nobody says nothing. But his stats, his stats still show that he averaged a triple double. It's no different, and I have a problem because. Everybody protects Steph Curry. It, it, every superstar get criticized. I actually think the opposite. I actually think that people are a little harder on Curry than they probably should be. When you're talking about expectations, once again, there's never been another player in the history of the NBA at his stature that had the expectation that he has. Even Russell Westbrook did not have the expectations that Steph has. LeBron James to Kevin Durant to Russell Westbrook. Perk, why do you think James? Steph? Listen, listen. I agree with you because I love Steph. I love, I love watching him. Too, one of the but I don't take pleasure in this. But why do you think it is people can't just tell the truth? He doesn't hit big shots in the finals. This is the first year he did it. But when it came down to it, shot on the line, fate of the universe, last game at Oracle, hit or miss, That's he what, missed. They went and got KD. Why they went and got KD? Because they don't trust Steph to close the game. Why do you think people take care of Steph? Huh? Why do you think they're quick to criticize Westbrook but not to I, I don't Because Westbrook has never won shit. Why is that even a question? Westbrook has never won anything. He had his team up 3-1 against a team that had less physical ability than his team. All they had to do was win one more game. At least the Golden State Warriors, they were up 3-1 on the Cleveland Cavaliers, but the Cleveland Cavaliers had way more talent than the Golden State Warriors. That series never should have been 3-1 at the advantage of the Golden State Warriors in the first place. That Cleveland Cavaliers team was set up to be the super team for that, you know, for that time period in the mid-2010s. There was no way that the Warriors should have been winning 70 games every season and the Cavaliers were winning 50 games and, you know, sneaking into the playoffs at the four seed. I mean, that, that was ridiculous to begin with. And Skip Bayless is the only one who has 
a perspective on it that is reasonable or, you know, has some type of rationale. That series should never have been closed. The Cleveland Cavaliers should never have been down 3-1. But just getting back to the point, to ask the question of why Russell Westbrook is held to a standard and, and Stephen Curry is not castigated to the same degree, Stephen Curry is a winner. Russell Westbrook is not a winner. Some people say they want to win, and other people show you that they want to win. Steph Curry consistently shows you that he wants to win because he sacrifices. He's the golden boy. All right. The one above criticism. No one we got to go. Yeah, we got to go. We don't even have time to comment at this point. Thank you so much for coming out of time. <laughs> All right, but anyway, that's basically it on that. That's a good thing for Steph Curry. If he has people who seek to, um, to criticize him, even when he might not deserve it, that's a good sign. That means that his stature in the league is getting higher and higher and higher. But he is going to have to win an NBA Finals MVP for that to be the icing on his cake. He does need that because that's the big difference. That's the difference between being a top 25 all-time player and a top 11 or top 12 all-time player because the things that he's accomplished, no little man have, has ever accomplished in the history of the NBA. But anyway, peace.